uh, Tampa that was the Gulf Coast Safe Street Summit. Summit. And two of us attended it. Corey and I both were at the meeting, and Corey has agreed to tell us, you know, tell you all about what we saw at that meeting. So okay. I'll take it away. Take it away, Corey. Um, yeah. One of the really great things about the Gulf Coast Safe Street Summit is that it focused on complete streets, so everything from uh, transit ridership to accessibility for um, older members of the community uh, to low-income communities to having discussions with a panner, panel of different mayors from throughout the community to get their take on things. So it was really looked at from from the ground, from nonprofits, from people who are users and writers, um, to you know executives. So it was really interesting and well-rounded um, day where we had a lot of discussion. Um, I learned a startling fact that uh, seven of the most dangerous places to walk, bike, uh, take a car um, are in Florida. Right. So um, just that was kind of the first thing that was said at that meeting to kind of set the tone. And from there, we had a lot of good suggestions about um, different ways to to uh, go about that. Is there anything that you in particular wanted to highlight, Gloria? No, I mean, what you were, it was the couple of things. Within, it was sponsored out of Tampa. It was a Hillsborough County uh, MPO function, um, and so it had a little bit more of a Hillsborough focus than a Pinellas. But like you said, like Rick Kreisman was one of the speakers there, so you know there was still some Pinellas involvement and they did regularly talk about you know pedestrians and transit riders they did they did add that they did keep talking about transit being a part of it but I didn't see tra transit as being you know a major driver I'd, I'd love to see transit be a major driver in that so because then it makes pedestrians ability to get places even better um, but it was it was a they said it was a start you know and and it was it was so interesting, and I'm, I'm very glad I went as well. So, well, thank you very much, Corey. Yeah, that was it, we, we, I, we, great speakers, a lot, very interesting program. Um, and then the other thing I was going to just cover with you what what the board covered at their their last meeting, and and um, I I would advise it again. I think I've said this before: is if you get a chance, go on the website and watch some of the video from the board meetings because it's it's amazing the amount of dimension there is to how they discuss things that that relate to us um, but uh, in terms of the the actual action items which they did or the things that were I think the most interesting they did talk about the regional transit feasibility plan and they had they had to basically agree to a memorandum of didn't have to agree they did agree to a memorandum of uh, understanding to say that basically you know PSTA is is uh, in support of what is going forward with this not necessarily how it's going to end up but that the process is in in in, the, in order that PSTA is supporting as well and um, and they also said that the sort of the oversight of it it started out with with heart you know being the primary driver on it but the way I understood it, and if I'm saying this wrong, please correct me. You're doing great. <laughs> but You're doing but great. that that now T Barda, which is the Tampa Bay Regional Transit Authority, which oversees the regional transit elements of it, is now going to be overseeing it more than Hart or PSTA or Pasco. That this is in fact truly a regional focus. You know, we are PSTA and we are PSTA riders, but it, this program will obviously affect us a great deal as well. So, um, so those were some of the, some of the really um, there, there were a number of other issues, but those were some I think the key things that I took away from what was at the last board meeting. Was there anything you wanted to add about that? Uh, no, I think you covered pretty well. Okay, thank you. Okay, now uh, the next item on our agenda then um, is oh, okay, actually there were two things I wanted to add before we move to the forward Pinellas. Um the flamingo tester registration. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of us that have registered. If anyone else is interested in registering for Flamingo Fairs, let us know by the end of the meeting. Um, and then the other thing is we need people to volunteer for the, the workshop um, on the PSK internal improvement uh, task force. 
if you're interested, then this is there's no pressure on this at all. But but we have again one, two, three, four, five, six of us that have signed up, and that we will have a meeting after the next track uh, meeting to follow up on the this this uh, initiative. So again, if anyone is interested who hasn't signed up, let Marianne know. Okay, then. Um, I'd like the forward Pinellas report for this day. Thank you. And again, let me say once again, it's my privilege to serve as the track representative on Forward Pinellas. Forward Pinellas is the Metropolitan Planning Organization. They rebranded themselves and we're doing the exact same thing. I wanted to go to that meeting. I just happened to be busy. But everything you saw on the Hillsborough side, we're doing over here on the Pinellas side. It's inspirational. I would ask all of you guys to come to the Forward Pinellas either the board meetings or the uh, CAC, the Citizen Advisory Committee. Uh, they usually meet two days after us. Thursday this month, it's uh, 10 days because of the way the month started. It'll be a week from Thursday. Um, we did the exact same things, complete streets. Uh, like any good board, they got some sta uh, state money and they're uh, meeting it out to had people put in bids, uh, 100,000 for this, half a million for that. Uh, and so it was neat to see them actually uh, encouraging cities and, and an honest-to-goodness contest. Oldsmar won uh, some money to take Old St. Pete Road that goes back through the residential neighborhood and make it more uh, accessible for bike lanes and that. So they, were, they won the one that's for the actual production. Dunedin got, uh, won the grant for the analysis uh, uh, downtown. Uh, there much earlier in the project. So they had a couple of contests out there and Largo bid and Seminole bid and Tarpon bid. So it was great. It was great both to see that all the cities are aware of complete streets, not just uh, St. Pete itself, who was way ahead of the game, uh, but to see the other cities uh, catching up. And uh, what better way than to, you know, to have a contest for some grant money to get people all lined up. And um, the ones that lost were, were kind of like, hey, how come not us? Hey, next year, come on. There's, there's, you know, it was great. It was great to see. Um, the other thing that uh, I saw at our meeting at, on uh, Ford Pinellas uh, was everyone we're doing here, which was so inspirational. I don't know if they were reading our minutes, but we put together a charter statement. Uh, we are sending letters to the board and writing position papers. And so it's the same thing where the citizens group is saying, we don't want to just sit around rubber stamping what the board does or read yesterday's newspapers and, and say, yeah, me too but are doing the exact same things. And so I can't figure out if it's uh, because of our demographic in Pinellas County that we're angrier or older or we have more time on our hands or what, but we're really, you know, as I go around the country, uh, a more activist uh, overview board. And, um, or is it that the way Florida has set up its boards that, you know, that maybe the, 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 the Elected boards don't have enough power due to local content, so we're going to go have the tail wag the dog that says, we want this stuff. In any case, it's neat to see that happening both here in track and there in Forward Pinellas. The last thing I'll repeat is what I passed out last month. We get one every month, which is the Morbid the Fatality Map, uh, where we're pedestrians, bicycles, <laughs> cars, uh, directly involved in a death, or later, you, you, know, you got an accident, you had a heart attack, you died three days later and X's and O's and squares and triangles. Um, every month we get an update to that and it is everybody is well aware of it. From F dot down, every county has been um, mandated that any project you do, if it's painting a curb green, has to have some kind of a statement about how it's going to address uh, saving lives. Uh, you know, if you're widening a lane or narrowing a lane or planting a tree or digging one up, how does that, you know, at least you've got to genuflect to this notion that too many people are getting killed, what are you doing about it? Anytime you spend a dollar of Florida money, it's got to be in there. So it's really neat to, uh, I mean, on the one hand, uh, I forget what the number was, 143 people or something were killed last year, and, and that's 143 too many. So uh, if you go, again, to the Forward Pinellas uh, CAC, CAC, Citizen Advisory Committee Board, uh, web page, you can see this map is out there every month. I passed you all one last month. It was great. I, uh, as an engineer, I mean, that's the kind of stuff I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. I'd love for you guys to come get involved. It's wonderful. You can just, just like here, put your name in and become a rep. Uh, John did that. And again, it's my privilege to serve there. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Well, thank, thank you. 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 You give good reports, too. Thank you very much. It's very, very interesting. Um, <coughs> um, I'm glad that PSTA track is involved yeah. with officially yes. with it, too, because we are <coughs> an important, important function of what they're doing. Um, okay, the next item on our agenda, the first action item, is the uh, review of the minutes. Have all of you had a chance to look at the minutes? Does anyone have any changes or corrections? Mm -hmm. Then I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes as written. I'll make a motion. Okay, we have a motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much. The next action item on our agenda is the PSTA Incremental Regional Transit Improvements, and that will be Cassandra Borchers. Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'll come around here. The mic's not working. Good afternoon. Hello. Um, this is kind of exciting. Not kind of. It really is exciting when we get a chance to look at things about where we are today, the vision of where we want to go to, but that there's something that we actually take action on today. So the, the action for you today is to accept money from the Florida Department of Transportation to extend the 100X. But I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't start with turning this on and then <laughs> showing you the routes that we have today that are regional in nature. So we have a, a few of our of, of you take these routes on a regular basis. The 300X, uh, which goes from our Omerton Road park and ride across the Howard Franklin to downtown Tampa, and the 100X, which goes from Gateway Mall across the Gandhi through Britain Plaza and then on to downtown Tampa. Um, and these really aren't enough for what we need to connect regionally. Um, they are very focused on commuter service and in some cases run more than hourly, especially in the middle of the day. Uh, so we're, we'd like to make some improvements and in June, during our June service change, uh, we are proposing that we add a stop at the Tampa International Airport on the 300X. This would be the first time that Pinellas County will have a connection to Tampa International Airport. And it's because of the investments that the Aviation Authority and the Florida Department of Transportation have made in the Consolidated Rental Car Facility, Sky Connect, and the Intermodal Center there at the airport that we're able to do this now and do it efficiently. The other change is extending from Gateway Mall down to downtown St. Petersburg, the 100X. Again, these are about 13 trips a day some in the morning, some in the evening, and just a couple in the middle of the day. Um, but the Florida Department of Transportation is giving us the funding uh, from, for us to take every single run we have on the 100X that, that ends at Gateway Mall and bring it down to St. Petersburg. And that will happen in June. However, there is a bigger picture at play. And so we wanted to go over how we are using this first piece as part of getting to that bigger picture. This is the map from uh, phase two or step two of the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan. And you will see a lot about this plan and the public discussion over the next few months of the spring, summer, and into the fall. This regional map is nothing new to, to us at PSTA because we've been looking at these routes and how we connect into the region for quite some time. In fact, we have a couple of options that we've been looking at for our regional routes that come out of our community bus plan. Uh, one is to focus um, our effort on, on the routes that we have today, expanding them to have a more robust service, especially for going to the airport, making sure that that matches up with the service that is at the airport. Um, so focusing on um, on downtown St. Petersburg, we of course have our Central Avenue BRT, which is our real catalyst project. This is the highest ridership corridor in the region, and this is where we are putting our investment in BRT. Um, Brad and some board members and some business leaders are going up to uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, this weekend and early next week to talk to um, congressional leaders about that project. And these other, these other services um, we are looking at how we can improve, improve them. You'll see 
There are, in place for this to happen, are some capital improvements that are being proposed um, and planned for by the Department of Transportation. Some of this is a bus on shoulders between downtown St. Petersburg and Gandhi. Um, another section would be express lanes, where the bus could run in express lanes across the Howard Franklin Bridge. You'll see a new gateway intermodal center on the map as well. So a new way for us to connect all of our routes with parking and housing and mixed use development. And, and that is something that the MPO is working on through their gateway master plan, which I'm sure Dave will talk about more in, um, in months to come. And then of course our Beach Express as part of this, as well as something for North County, bringing people into the Gateway area and then across the Howard Franklin Bridge to West Shore and downtown. This is a big vision and we, and we know that some people will say, well, why don't you have service, why don't you keep some service on the Gandhi? And that's still an option for us to talk about as we sort of move from where we are today to where we wanna be in June to where we wanna be in, in five years or more. I'd like to show you this video that was put together by the Florida Department of Transportation about the Bus on Shoulder the project. The Department of Transportation initiated a study to develop statewide guidance and criteria for bus on shoulder operations in Florida. The bus on shoulder concept has been utilized by several transit agencies around the country. It is a cost-effective measure to improve transit travel time and reliability and increase ridership. When speeds drop below 35 miles per hour in the general purpose lanes, the bus may merge onto an 11 foot to 12 foot wide shoulder bypassing traffic. Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority, or PSTA, is collaborating with FDOT on a pilot project along the five mile segment of Interstate 275 in Pinellas County. Pinellas County is one of the most densely populated counties in the state with two major cities, St. Petersburg and Clearwater. These cities are major centers for jobs and commerce and have experienced consistent growth over the years. With growth, there comes a need for an efficient transportation system and alternative modes of transportation. The proposed bus on shoulder project is consistent with the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan. Currently, the I-275 corridor is operating at a level of service F during morning and evening peak periods, which indicates the corridor is heavily congested. These conditions are expected to get worse over the next 20 years, if nothing changes. <coughs> In an effort to maintain schedule reliability, PSTA plans to implement bus on shoulder. With few infrastructure improvements, the bus can travel on the shoulder and bypass congestion. PSTA buses will operate on an 11.5 foot shoulder to ensure drivers have adequate space to operate comfortably and safely. A profile thermoplastic marking strip will be added to the outside edge of travel along the corridor as a safety guide for vehicles. The bus on shoulder corridor will have signs showing drivers the beginning and end of the bus on shoulder segment. Signs throughout the corridor will alert drivers to watch for buses on shoulder and warn drivers that only authorized buses are allowed on the shoulder. PSTA will provide advanced training for the bus drivers operating on the shoulder. The bus on shoulder route is an extension of Route 100X to downtown St. Petersburg. While the current 100X service operates as a commuter route during peak hours, PSDA's vision is to eventually operate this route every 30 minutes from downtown St. Petersburg to downtown Tampa during the hours of 5 a.m. and 12 a.m. Monday through Friday. In the northbound direction, the bus on shoulder route will begin at the I-275, I-375 interchange. Using the 5th Avenue ramp, the bus will merge on to I-275 North. If the bus on shoulder conditions have been met, the bus will proceed onto the shoulder. At interchanges along the corridor, the bus will yield to oncoming traffic, merging back into traffic if necessary. There is the potential to add ramp meters and busy interchanges to allow a gap for the bus to stay on shoulder. The bus will continue on I-275 North to the 22nd Avenue exit, where the bus will make an interim stop at the 22nd Avenue Park and Ride Line. pickup, the bus will merge back onto I-275, continuing to the Gandhi Boulevard ramp where it will exit the interstate. At this location, the bus route will continue onto the Gandhi Bridge, providing a direct connection to downtown Tampa for commuters. In the southbound direction,
direction, the bus will merge onto I-275 South at the Gandy Boulevard ramp and continue to the 22nd Avenue Park and Ride Line. The bus will then re-enter I-275 South and proceed to the 5th Avenue exit, utilizing the outside shoulder as permitted. The multi-agency partnership between the Florida Department of Transportation, PSTA, Federal Highway Administration, and state and local law enforcement provides the foundation for a successful pilot project. The Bus on Shoulder project is scheduled to start in 2019. Stay tuned for more information. If you have any questions in the meantime, contact Elba Lopez or Gabrielle Matthews with the Florida Department of Transportation. As you can see, while we are working on the service improvements, the DOT in partnership is really helping us be more efficient with these <clears throat> options that, th that they would fund. So we'll work with them to see how quickly that they could get that online. That doesn't stop us from making the June service change. It's just when, when those improvements would, would be available to us to use, we would be able to have more efficiency on the routes that we have going from from downtown St. Petersburg North using the I-275 corridor. So today, the action is really to accept the funds from DOT so that we can extend the 100X. Um, we will be making the improvement to the 300X as part of our regular June service change, but in order for us to, to make the 100X change, we'd like to accept these funds so that they could pay for 100% of that gateway to downtown St. Petersburg extension. With that, I will entertain yeah, the discussion. Question. Question. Yes. Um, this is part where the uh, lane, what is it called, the lane reorganization project? Uh, do you know the timing? First off, I love bus on shoulder. I was in Raleigh Durham over the summer. They're using it there. Fantastic. It's mm -hmm. great. And I think what's mostly folks are reminded of that truck with the flat tire was if you get a flat tire during rush hour, pull off into the grass so the bus can go through. Um, but uh, we're, uh, 275 through 38th, 34th Street and 52nd Street has all those crazy lane changes and forced exits. Was part of FDOT's commitment was to is it called lane reorganization? It's called a lane continuity. Continuity, lane right. continuity. So they've been working on that for some time, knowing that they sort of need to fix that so you're not shifting from lane to lane when you're on 275. Since that study was finished, there the TB Next project has also come, right. you know, matured a yes. little bit and added the segment all the way to downtown right. St. Petersburg. So. The, the department is, as far as I know, the department is taking that lane continuity study and then pairing it with a new PD&E that would look at express lanes in the corridor. So, so I think it'll still be, so it, it's going through their project development process, um, which is first. why the bus on shoulders could be an interim solution for us until they get through that process and, and get the, the funding to completely reconfigure the, the interstate. What, what I was just thinking is when they start doing lane continuity, it's going to be a mess rolling that around, and the bus on the shoulder is going to be confusing folks, too. Thank goodness they're not happening at the same time, I guess was what I was saying. Well, I, the, the, the department still needs to be encouraged to move this forward. Yes. There's still, a, even though this is a less costly option than yes. putting in express lanes, um, it is still something that they need to program. And so we need to send that message that thank you so much for doing the study on this. Now we want to see you build it. Yeah. The park and ride area, is that going to be, there's going to be another, uh, how do I put it? And the, where they're going to start, where they're talking about, it's kind of like a small area. Are they going to outgrow it or do you know what they're going to do with that part? Well, there's, so there's two park and rides in our system. One is the, the Largo, the Elmerton Road yeah. park and ride, which we've recently redone. Okay. Um, and then the 22nd Avenue park and ride, we have not been using, they, uh, it has been used for um, carpooling yeah. uh, with T-Barda. Um, and it is kind of small, but it's a start. 
Okay. So two things that we're doing with parking on this corridor is one, we'd like to redo the park and ride so that it's, um, we could repave it, um, maybe add a slip ramp, talk to the department about putting some ramp metering in so that the bus could get in and get some priority back onto the interstate. And the other part is we are working with the city of St. Petersburg. Um, they have some, uh, some funding left over from an MPO project and we're looking at park and ride options closer to the downtown. Yeah, I have a, so first, I think it's really good kind of taking the lead of going all the way to St. Pete and to the airport, two things. Now, so I take the 300X, and especially in the evening, if before they put, if they put those extra lanes in, it's really backed up already. Right. And so going to the airport and then coming back is probably a 20, maybe even 30 minute way out. And so I was wondering, are they going to add an additional bus earlier, or is it going to leave earlier, or are there, are there times going to stay the same? We would, we would extend the times so just to be the same amount of trips, but we would have to space out the time so that we could get people to work on time. Because you're right, it is going to take us a little extra time. Um, we haven't completely finished the schedule of that, so I would take that comment to our scheduling department and just make sure that maybe we're getting people to the right end of their trip yeah. at the time that they need. Um, we do have our public engagement group going out to survey folks on the 300X to sort of understand what the needs are and how we can incorporate this new stop. Yeah, because I would only say, I showed this to some people on the 300X, and I think a, a lot of them are business people who have a car, they park at the park and ride and drive. Mm -hmm. And so there's like a break even point where they're just not gonna take anymore if it takes too right. long. I also have our operations folks um, going out on the Howard Franklin Bridge to see if there's some space where you could do some bus on shoulder mm -hmm. piloting. But I have, we haven't talked to the department about that yet. <laughs> They're just looking at it. They haven't yeah. taken a bus out. Uh -huh. yeah. So how long does that, uh, like a couple questions. Um, how long is that $234,000 going to, um, you know, fund this expansion is it and are you gonna have to go back are we gonna PSTA gonna have to go back to F dot every year to get money for this? Um, there are two kinds of funds that F dot puts into operations. One is called service development grants, which you'll hear which we go after quite a bit. And those are 50-50 funds um, and they have a three year expiration. The other is called urban corridor funds and these are much more precious and much fewer at um, in, at the department, um, but they do not have an expiration date, and they and they can be used for up to 100% of the service. So these funds are programmed right now. They're programmed out five years, and every year when we do our um, request to the department, we add a new fifth year. And so the ones that the the I can't say that the program will last forever because I don't I don't know that. But there is no end date for the program at this time. So we've been using these funds for decades on very specific routes related to regional service. Do you have any other questions, Richard? No. So you had a couple, okay. No, just those two. Um, if there are no other questions, then I would entertain a motion to approve. Oh. Like, I'd like to make that motion. This is a wonderful, oh, okay. wonderful oh. program. Can I second it? Because I'm really excited. <laughs> okay. um, all right. We have a motion and a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor of approving this? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? The motion carries. <laughs> Ask for the money. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, our next item on the agenda is the uh, is an information item, and this is about the the initiative we talked about was taking a next step on our safety uh, initiative and, and the idea of having some kind of an award. And the marketing department at PSTA took our guidance, uh, our suggestions, and they have come together with a, a suggested program for us, and then you ask introduces. Hello, good afternoon. I am Cindy Raskin Schmidt. I'm the Director of Communications and Marketing here at PSTA. So as Gloria said, uh, one of your initiatives was to come up with an award 
um, system where you as uh, public transit riders can recognize businesses, developments, um, and municipalities who have done an exceptional job of creating good public transit access outside of their uh, buildings and businesses and things like that. So we took the framework of which you all had discussed and we did several brainstorming sessions internally of how we could take this program and make it something that people would get excited about, make it something long lasting, make it a perpetual program. So if you look at your place in front of you, you should have, everybody should have, if you don't have one, raise your hand and Marianne can get you one. It says Transit Riders Advisory Committee Gold Star Award for Transit Access. It's a loose sheet at the very end. It's a loose sheet at the very end. Thank you, Corey. Um, so this is the idea that we put together of how we can uh, put this program out on the street for you all. Basically, um, just to give you a quick rundown, and as we go through this, this proposal, we really feel strongly that you all had a really great idea of wanting to recognize businesses and municipalities, and we really want it to be your program. We at PSTA Marketing Department are going to help you market it and help you get press about it. Um, but it really is something that you all need to feel strongly about and have ownership of. So <laughs> our idea is that you would create a list of qualifications for an entity who could apply for gold star status. And we call it gold star because I was thinking, you know, when you're a kid, you get the gold star in your spelling test. You can call it a blue star. You could call it a blue steering wheel. You could call it whatever you want to call it. You know, that's open. We can chat about that, brainstorm that a little bit. But let's just go with gold star for now because it's a fun, fun way to label it. Um, you would create the list of qualifications for how a company could get gold star status. Think about good housekeeping seal. It's something they apply for. It's a designation that they earn by meeting certain criteria. You could nominate as members or you can invite businesses or developers or cities to self-nominate for this program. Um, the applications would come in through Mary Ann and she would kind of go through a, 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 like a checklist to see if they've hit all the points that are asked for on your qualification list. And then the list of applicants would come before you as a committee to look at them, evaluate them, and either approve them or, or don't. Hopefully everybody would be approved. The idea here is we want lots and lots of people to have a gold star. We want more places with good public transit access for our riders. Um, so from there, there's an opportunity. So if you select um, a business, uh, an entity, I'm just gonna keep calling them entities instead of giving you the whole list of who they possibly could be. If you select an entity, um, if you were the person that nominated them, or if you wanted to be a representative, then we would in invite you to take the opportunity to go present that award. Um, and that could be a certificate, could be a, a graphic that goes on their website that shows that they've met this. Um, and it could be like a sticker or a plaque or something that we put on the actual bus stop. We could put it in the bus shelter. This is a gold star transit rider approved bus stop. You have a little bit of notoriety in the positive way. Um, there's great opportunity for press potential, especially for your first one. Um, one example that was floated was your Woodlands um, stop that you all helped initiate some, some pretty great improvements at you know, as an idea for you to maybe consider for your first one. But I know there's others. I know everybody has their favorite bus stop or recognizes somebody that's been really great. So um, that's the proposal. Um, we have a little timeline on here. Um, I really just wanted to present to you all the idea and then open up for discussion, see what you think of this idea, um, where you'd like to go with it. Um, if we can all kind of come to an agreement today about what direction you want that to go, the timeline on the second page or maybe it's on the back page, um, we would have you all work on developing the criteria, um, developing the application, and then we would have you um, talk about that in April, have you bring it to the May planning committee. So somebody in this group would come to the planning committee, uh, the board, and present the idea to get their buy-in. Um, and then we would move it into the graphics department where we would create graphics for you, um, create a marketing plan and project for you um, with the potential of having this launch in June or July, probably July. She's a little busy with um, some X routes that are having to do this. So, I mean, July is kind of the target. So with that, um, questions, comments, really dis really discussion for you guys to have, and then tell us where you want to go with it. Uh, you know, a couple real quick things, too. I made some notes when, when you were talking. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we had talked about is the idea of catching people doing the right thing is sometimes an, an important thing. It's like we always like to complain about stuff, but where we see something that has been done well, we want to reward the people. That's what happened with Woodland Square. They didn't come to us looking for information. 
I saw that they'd finally put in a walkway, and it was it was very exciting. Um, and that one led me to the fact that I see sometimes these may be more than one recipient together. In fact, in Woodlands, it was because of the city of Oldsmar asking the developer to do it. The developer did it. The Woodland asked for, or uh, Oldsmar asked for it. And so I can see them both receiving the award. And 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 you know, we were talking about the idea of you know, well, yeah. somebody could, one of us could go to the Oldsmar city you know town meeting and and you know talk about it, present this and so forth. Um, yeah, and yeah, so those were. Oh, and the other thing is, it, you know, when you talked about bus stops, it's not necessarily even just somebody asked, well, does it have to be close to a bus stop? And it's access to the bus stop. So, you know, how you, a couple of you have heard me complain about how awful Countryside Mall is. They've got tons of bus stops, but it would be the kind of thing where if they ever did something right, it would be. <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, am I putting my opinion in it, it, there? It's awful. A second. It's awful. And and so yeah, they, they might win win it just for doing it, not necessarily for a specific stop. So um, that those are just some of the thoughts that I have. Um, first of all, does anyone ha have any other general comments about this? Does I, th does this sound like what? It sounds good to me, but that I'm not the only one deciding this. Does this all sound like it's, it's making great sense? Yeah. One of the things we talked about is, in your case, you talked about your town actually doing something. Yes. And it would be something where we envision you going to the town and presenting an award, that they fixed the sidewalks that made it impossible for you to get this done. So this, after your last meeting, I went to Cindy, and I said, Cindy, you've got to help me with this. <laughs> um, and so I, I just want to thank Cindy and her team for, uh, yeah. for thinking about how we could do this, because I think this meets your goal of wanting to give out as many of these gold stars or whatever you decide to call them, blue wheels, whatever, um, uh, as you can, sort of keep this in the forefront of a lot of people's minds. And the idea of having uh, one or more of you go to the city council of a town that does a good job and presenting this to both the, the, the municipality and the developer, I think just reiterates how much we appreciate when people do the right thing. the right thing yeah um, and it, it serves this great purpose of giving us a higher profile that there really is a group of citizens we really are out there looking for people doing the right thing and we're advocating for folks that don't drive cars don't get on us 19 don't take up parking places right and and so when you do something nice somebody is actually looking somebody cares and somebody said thank you and by the way it's us yeah. you know so if you're looking for someone to advocate for you call us we're here you know yeah. anything we can do to be less invisible mm -hmm. no, I it's a really great program so I think the next the next steps unless you have like some specific comments about names or whatever I think the next steps would be that next month this will give you some time to kind of digest what Cindy's put together um, and then come back next month and talk about what criteria you want to use so that um, if, if Gloria brings an idea and says, I think that this would be a great development, that we can say, yes, they meet the criteria, um, or you can start to look for, for new developments that, that do that. And then if you have, over the next month, have some ideas, different ideas for the name of what we call this, I think we're all open to to that so it's maybe an agreement in principle from the from the group about the process that Cindy's laid out and, and then and then some time to think about it yes Dave um, I don't know if this is the right form does track have a logo I know PSTA does with the oval do are we just the word track written out next to PSTA yes you are Okay. Yeah, we don't. So, we don't typically. We try to stay with just the PSTA logo, and then perfect. sometimes we have That's great. what we like to call graphic treatments. There we are to the name of something, but we try to stay with one branding. As in PSTA scheduling, PSTA yeah. yes. employee and development, yeah, exactly. PSTA track. Mm -hmm. okay. exactly. And then, um, do we all agree that it would come from PSTA? Track that it would come from track, yeah. yeah. But, but what we are a part of PSTA, exactly. I think. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So well, again, and I think too, when you go out and give the when you go give the presentation, we would always have a PSA staffer come with you. Excellent. You know, Excellent. we wouldn't just dangle you out there, kick Excellent. you out on your own. I was thinking you were in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Some of us would probably more bold. Um, okay. Um, so I, you know, this is not a binding type of thing, but I, how many of you agree with 
the direction that we're going with this. I mean, does anyone oppose what we're doing? I, I would like to have PSDA continue, have marketing continue to work yes. on this. And, and next month we, we will do, you know, what we said. Well, thank you all so much. This was a really great idea that you all came up with, and it was exciting to brainstorm with Cassandra about where we can take it. So it's going to be it's going to be great, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what you all can do with it. Thank you. Thank you know, it's interesting because Mr. Miller has pointed this out, and I know I looked too. We are the only transit area that it, that has a citizens advisory advisory committee that reports to the board. You know, I, I think Sarasota has something like that, but I look Hillsborough doesn't have this. And and so yeah. you know we are we are, and we are the riders. And so how great it is that they are listening yeah. to some of the things that we're experiencing. Okay, uh, next item on the agenda is the Direct Connect extension. And I see you standing there. Are you going to present that? I am Bonnie today. Okay, you're Bonnie today. Yeah, <laughs> that was a, that was a hint. <laughs> um, Bonnie and Jacob and Heather are at the Shared Use Mobility Conference right now. That's why Bonnie is not here today to present this to you. And this is exactly what they are talking about at this conference, is how do we go from being just a bus company to being helping people with their mobility management. And so uh, you, you have heard about our Direct Connect program. Um, as, our, as our solution for first mile, last mile, um, and I'm sure that you know that we have been nationally recognized for this partnership. We are the first in the nation, Brad likes to say, maybe the first on the planet, to, <laughs> to um, partner with Uber, taxi, and wheelchair provider in a way that nobody else has done before, and that is to help provide <coughs> rides and where we pay a portion of the ride that people take on, the, on their Uber, United Taxi, or wheelchair provider to the bus stop. <coughs> we started this um, in 2016, just in Pinellas Park, just to sort of dip our toe in the water and see how can we make this work within a certain zone to get people to the bus. Um, and we did well enough that we expanded it and said, well, let's expand it to the entire county and take that zone concept and say, all right, you, you can take it from anywhere in your zone to the designated stop to get on the bus. Um, and we And we started to to decrease the cost so that it would cost somebody about a dollar. Now, since then, some of the service providers have increased their cost. So now it's, it's about $2 to get to, to the bus. Um, but you can get all, from all, anywhere in the county onto the PSTA system. So now it's time for phase three, where we make it even better. And, and looking at our entire system and removing the zones because we found that people had had issues with that sometimes they'd have to go north to go south if their, their direct connect stop was not in the right direction and and look at our core network and how can we get people to our best services again focusing on those highest frequency services we're also moving away from the slider which takes some some action every single time to a promo code is real easy to remember uber to psda does what it says, says what it does, right? Um, and we would start this new phase of our expansion um, in early April. Oh, I wanted to fix the volume. We also have uh, <laughs> some great marketing things for, uh, prepared. Um, in 30 days okay. mm -hmm. yes so we've been oh, working on this while that's like we'll start ready to, to go see, start yeah. to see little cards in your uber app um, and we'll have um, some some other marketing surprises along <laughs> I get the best part today because I get two videos. 
this. <laughs> um, now I know why my son does that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So we're going to put that out on our social media. That um, little animation was done completely in a house by our marketing department, Lizelle Murray. So I really appreciate her and, and Cindy and all her staff and the work that they're going to that they have put into this and that they will put into this. Mm -hmm. So that was a, just an information item if you have any questions um, about our new program. I saw the wheelchair transport logo at the very end of Yes. The, how does it work for people like us? So you would call into wheelchair transport, mm -hmm. um, tell them what stop, and they um, know that you are at going to or from a, a PSTA bus stop in order to qualify for the discount. I see an opportunity. <laughs> okay, great. Um, anything else? Any questions? Fantastic. Yeah, it is. It's excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. It is. It, it's so neat to hear. You've had two interesting stories of things again mm -hmm. where we're, we're is, our system is being innovative. This is this is like the best meeting ever. I'll say I live in Safety Harbor and so had been in that first zone two. My only option was to go up to Oldsmar, which was exactly where I was never going. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a, a novelty up until now, but this is fantastic. These points, uh, 19 and Sunset, Golf to Van Coachman, that is exactly where, where I'm going. Go. So this is fantastic. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Okay, and then the last item on the agenda is Mr. Miller is going to present about the American bus benchmark. Okay. Well, to uh, Dave's point on the Direct Connect, um, you know, by us being on sort of the bleeding edge of this uh, partnership with Uber, we're uh, constantly trying to hone it and make it better and make it easier. And I think, I, just, I think we're making it better and better. I still think we can make it even better. Um, so. Uh, Please try it out um, under its new method, and then um, and then let us know. As we, I joked with the staff earlier, it's like our iPhone, so we have to come up with a 4.0 next year, and next year, and then a 5.0 the following year, and 6.0 the next year. We have to keep buying it. Um, okay, so I'm going to try to uh, just uh, maybe skip some of this, uh, but go into it just a little bit of detail about. A number of questions that the PSTA board has asked recently about ridership. As you uh, know or may have read or uh, seen, ridership nationwide has been declining and uh, uh, on public transportation services, it actually has been declining worldwide for the last couple of years. In addition, um, PSTA participates in what's called the American Bus Benchmarking Group, which is a group of transit systems, about 20 transit systems across the country, that share all of our data together to help us improve our performance. Unlike uh, a business, we're not really in competition with anybody else uh, for transit ridership in Pinellas County. So if there's an idea that is happening in Orlando or Atlanta or some other city, and we can benefit from that. We like to share that information with each other, and that's the whole idea of benchmarking. In fact, lots of private companies now even do benchmarking with their competitors to, to benefit. So we do that. This was a question that was asked at the, at the last board meeting by Commissioner Eggers, and it's just sort of a, you might be interested in this, how PSTA counts ridership uh, and how that is how we track ridership. We, f we, are re we have to follow certain rules in order to get federal and state dollars on how we track ridership, and so we follow those rules from the Federal Transit Administration. We are required to track what are called, in federal speak, unlinked trips. An unlinked trip is defined as riding on one bus in one direction. So a round trip by you or me is two unlinked trips. If, if we have a transfer in the middle of it and we actually ride on two different buses to a place and two buses back, that's four unlinked trips. Um, that's how every, every all transit 
really um, is tracked everywhere. It's the same, it's one consistent way. I'm, I'm a delta frequent flyer, that's how I earned my gold status, was how many legs. If I flew to yeah. Boston, I went to Atlanta to Boston to Atlanta home, I got four legs. There were folks during green light that considered that nefarious. One guy went one day, but he, you counted that as four trips. So that's how Delta called it. I mean, there's nothing nefarious about that. That's how you call count trips. Right, and actually it's um, uh, assumed that everyone does a round trip, which is not actually true. There's it's lots not. of people, especially now with our Direct Connect and other things that take, um, might take going only one way. Exactly. Um, or the airport. Exactly. Um, that's what I think a lot of people may have to do with our initial airport service. They may only be able to take it one way and they might have to take another mode back. Of course, the federal government makes it a little more complicated and this question came up at the last board meeting. Um, they um, ask us to categorize the ridership by different modes. Now, most of us think we do one mode. We, ride, we run buses. But they, there's different kinds of buses. There's commuter buses. There are um, they're, they're segmented into those buses that PSTA owns and operates with our own drivers. Those are called directly operated motor buses. And then there's like the Jolly Trolley, uh, which is a contracted uh, motor bus. All the trolley buses are called buses uh, in, in the federal government. And then, then there's another mode called demand response. And you might have heard us calling demand response DART is demand response because that means that um, it goes and where there's demand, that's where the route goes. The north, uh, up in northern Pinellas County, the connector routes are also considered demand response. So ridership on the uh, three routes that we have up in northern Pinellas County that deviate off the route to go pick people up, that's also categorized as demand response. So it just gets a little bit more complicated. Um, we report all this uh, data to the federal government every year in something called the National Transit Database. And if you Google that National Transit Database, it's really an awesome wealth of information about every transit system in the United States. You can pull up all sorts of data on them um, in reasonably easy to understand or see formats and compare PSDA to other systems and stuff. Um, I've been to seminars and it's been pointed out that the United States is one of the only countries in the world that has a national transit database. There's no such thing as a German um, transit database. Um, all the, but um, so it's, it's, a, it's a helpful data. Um, it's also used to provide funding based on a formula back to PSDA in every system. And all that data that goes into the fun, uh, formula that is tied to money does need to be reviewed by our auditors, and it is. And then, actually, ridership is not one of those items. Um, um, exactly. Anyway, as, um, as I said, ridership has been declining at PSTA, but also nationwide um, in almost every transit system in North America. Um, and there's been, it is, it's been happening for about two and a half years. It happened actually, PSDA's ridership started declining a little bit uh, later than most folks. And I think that is because we have so many tourists riding our transit system um, that kept riding, uh, keep riding and are maybe a little bit less, have less effect on some of the things that are impacting ridership than in other places. It's only been in the last couple of months Ridership's been declining uh, nationwide for about two years, but only in the last couple months have some of these academic reports come out and studies that have been done about why uh, ridership is going down. Because we're all wondering why ridership is going down. I lay awake at night wondering why <laughs> ridership is going down. So this is kind of a list of all the different studies that have just come out just in the last couple of months. Anyone talk about gas prices? Yeah, yeah. Um, this this sort of is a map. Uh, lots of this, some of this work was done by a local uh, researcher over at USF, uh, Dr. Steve Polzine, which some of you may have heard of. He has done some of these. So I, I stole this slide from him and some of these some of these others. He's done one. Of, he's doing one a study of this specifically for Florida transit systems for the Florida DOT. 
but he hasn't published all of his results yet. But you can see pretty much everywhere ridership is down. To summarize, the re looking at some of the numbers, is it saying that New York City, the ridership is down by 93%? No. Um, or what is that? 93%? I don't know exactly. I've actually sent an email to Dr. Polzina to ask him why, uh, why it says that. Okay. I, th I think that is um, in hundreds of thousands of rides. Oh, okay. So that would be like 9.3 million rides. Because Los Angeles is fairly large and Chicago is fairly large. Yeah. Okay. I think it is a reflection of the quantity of rides. But I, do, I was checking my email. He's not responding. Uh, but I noticed this too when I put this slide in. I was like, those aren't percentages. Um, no millions. The data uh, that has come out is somewhat uh, surprising to me. Lots of people have thought, well, Uber and Lyft are taking tra uh, transit's ridership away. And that has actually found not to be true. There's been some studies of, and the, they're pretty limited, because Uber and Lyft are incredibly, as we know, protective of their data. They don't tell anyone anything. They, it's, really hard, it's hard to get data for us, even on our own programs with Uber. But, the, um, the Shared Use Mobility Center, where the planning department is right now, they did some um, analysis and they got some data from Uber and Lyft and they found that, as, it, as you might expect, the vast majority of Uber and Lyft rides are happening on Friday and Saturday evenings. And they're happening in their short trips in the downtown cores of downtown uh, in cities. They are to go out to restaurants and bars. Um, there's virtually no Uber and Lyft usage in the suburbs, um, except if the airport is located in the suburbs. There's a lot of Uber and Lyft rides to and from the airport. That's the only destination outside of the downtown where Uber and Lyft is really catching too many riders. So it is, a, it is having an impact, but most PSTA rides and most public transit rides are not, you know, uh, just a mile in the downtown. They're 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 further than just in the down in downtown St. Petersburg or downtown Clearwater. So that to me was sort of surprising that they don't really think uh, Uber and Lyft is having that much of an effect. What now two studies have come out in a row pointing out its car ownership, and that was that was a little bit relieving to me in a really odd way because I was like, oh, well, that's the problem since the 1940s. Um, uh, we've dealt with that problem before. But since the, since the economic recession in 2009 and 2010, there was a massive amount of pent-up demand for cars. People were not buying cars in 2008, 9, and 10. And since we've been coming out of the recession, car ownership in the United States has been growing by as many, much as 10% per year the number of cars being sold. There was a big study uh, done by, uh, in the LA, in L Los Angeles County of transit ridership. And they were able to get a lot of data on car ownership and found that um, car ownership in low income areas of LA, um, where transit ridership was heaviest, car ownership has increased there even faster than the overall average because people are getting used cars. Um, I've had some discussions with Dr. Polzine about could we analyze that for Pinellas County? And he said to me that it's very hard in Florida, there's just not really good data on used car sales. Um, there's new car sales and that's kind of the best that he's been able to see. But what he found was um, this can have a major impact on ridership, and it you know, sort of makes sense. But every car, every, every household in America, on average, that goes from not having any cars to buying one car, reduces their annual transit ridership from that household by 191 trips. And uh, what he did was 
if you multiply the number of new cars in America times 191, um, you can explain the vast majority of transit ridership loss. You could do that. Now, that's not necessarily an academic uh, mathematical thing you can do. Um, the LA study also did something similar. Uh, they also passed a law in California that allowed undocumented immigrants to get driver's licenses. And there's certain areas of California that are, the number of driver's licenses are really increasing and transit ridership is declining and they, it's kind of the same effect. I thought this was an interesting um, graph here that I'll just explain. This, this was from the Los Angeles, or I'm sorry, this was from the APTA study. Right. And I think this sort of uh, uh, gets to the used car market as well. <laughs> this is a graph of um, auto loans, loans given to buy cars, segmented by credit score. So as you know, when you uh, get loans, you have a credit score, and the less income you have and other factors reduce your credit score. So the light blue, and this is over from 2004 to 2017, and you can see the economic recession. The number of loans given out in total dropped from uh, about $70 billion worth of loans and has grown now to, has more than doubled. It's about a hundred, it was really down almost to 60 to about 180 billion. So it's tripled um, in the last six or seven years. The number of, or the amount of loans given out for cars. The light blue at the top is the, um, um, or I'm sorry, the, the dark blue down here is the lowest credit score. And that's roughly equivalent to the lowest income area, uh, folks who are getting cars. And that segment of the auto loan, that area has grown even more than the overall average. That more and more people, and that's, that's overall a good thing, that um, the economy is getting better, people are able to get cars and have better mobility. Um, but that is also where mo most of the transit ridership, especially in areas like Pinellas County, where most of our ridership is lower income riders. There's only, the only study I've seen so far that, um, and there's other ones gonna, that are going to come out with other ideas. What can be done about this? What can a transit system do to affect this? The APTA study had three different areas. And they're kind of like a little bit Captain Obvious, in my opinion. But um, be more competitive, make your customers more loyal, and address other things that you have no control over. OK, <laughs> great. Improve time competitiveness. Obviously, everything in life is getting more competitive and uh, we have more or less time available for everything we do. How can you ride transit and make it more competitive? They suggest having <coughs> dedicated lanes so that the vehicles can, so that transit can be more competitive compared to driving. Well, we're doing that, as Cassandra's uh, video showed uh, along 275, FDOT's looking at that. We're looking at that on the Central Avenue BRT. Straighten routes, increase frequency on the core routes, um, rather than having these routes that meander all over the place, like the 444. I put a question mark by that because we're about to launch a, a community bus plan again, and um, I'm sure they will recommend some straightening of routes, but it's very hard for the PSDA board to vote to eliminate neighborhood services and redirect the service to other routes because people come to the board meetings. Uh, so we'll see. Strengthen affinity bonds and customer loyalty. There's some ideas that APTA had that we're actually doing within our Flamingo Fare system um, that are pretty complicated, but they are basically kind of like ways to reward more riding, like kind of like frequent flyer miles are on, on airplanes. One idea is called fare capping, where you put money on your transit pass and then um, like Flamingo, where it's, if it's automatically tied to your account, the more you ride, the less you pay. So automatically, without you doing anything on Flamingo, if you put, say, $20 on there, if you ride um, 
only one time, it's going to take off the, full, the 225 that a normal ride costs. But if you keep riding, it will automatically implement the lowest uh, pass cost to you. So you'll save money. Then the other idea is to maybe even do like a frequent flyer thing. Give points or rewards or, you know, Starbucks gives you little stars and little mm -hmm. stickers that you get and people love that stuff. Even if it doesn't actually get you anything. Um, the only way we can do that is that when we move to the smart card data where we can track uh, Brad's ridership. Right now we can't, we can track certain pass numbers, but we can't, we can't tie it to any individual. So we're doing some of that. And then address external factors. Increase of affordable housing. In our areas of downtown Clearwater and uh, downtown St. Petersburg, the housing market is going through the roof. And I even see with our own employees, they, have to, they are struggling to stay living where they're living uh, or to find a home that they can afford uh, in St. Petersburg. So they have to move to other areas like Pasco County, and then, which is not as transit friendly as where they live today. Reduce parking subsidies. If the more that we subsidize parking, the, um, that obviously has an effect on transit ridership. And then impact land decisions, transit support of streetscape design. You were talking about the uh, streetscape discussion. That obviously has a major effect on ridership. We had a big discussion at the board about the Route 444 and the service to the St. Petersburg Housing Authority, which I don't know if any of you have ever been there. It's very, very hard, no matter what kind of bus or ridership or service we provide to get there. Um, I will, I will probably go into all this stuff about the benchmarking because I know we're over time here. This is the idea that we drive our organization. Internally, we try to improve what we do for the customers by tracking as much data as we can. Um, these are the transit systems that all share their data all over the country. And there's a whole, we've recently, um, as a group, decided to add a whole bunch, there's a, a number of new ones that are coming on board, Milwaukee and Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, some out in California. We track all different kinds of ridership. Um, we, there's different kinds of data. There's, um, there's ridership that sort of is what they call context data. It, you know, Pinellas County is different than Nashville. Right. It is different. We have palm trees, they don't. Or Flint, Michigan, um, we're a little bit different than them. There's stuff about our transit system that is just gonna be different. Um, some transit systems carry a whole bunch of school kids. And at least for now, we don't, but I'm working on that. Um, some are located in a university town where none of the students are allowed to have cars. So then they have that. So one of the factors is, um, some, some cities are, you know, very concentrated downtown, that all the jobs are in the downtown, like where I used, I used to work, Des Moines, Iowa. People lived out in the corn, and then they took the bus to the state capitol in downtown Des Moines, and um, they didn't have very, they, the state didn't pay very well, so they, had, they rode the bus to and from, they could get a free bus ride, and then they would ride back out to their farm wherever they live, way out in the boondocks. And um, so we ran a whole bunch of buses just in the morning and then we ran them back out at night. And so that's, they're up here at the far end. They run a whole bunch of more buses in the peak hour and they, they don't run very many in the middle of the day. Whereas PSTA and some of these other more evenly uh, populated areas where the employment is spread out all over the place, we run, we basically send the buses out in the morning and at our peak, we only have about, what, about 25% more than all day. The buses pretty much stay out all day. This is kind of a um, intensity of road usage is sort of a measure of like how great your, your transit system is. You hear people say, well, Pinellas just doesn't have very good transit compared to New York City, of course. So one way to kind of measure that is 
take the number of uh, miles of roadway that we run routes on and divide by the number of miles that the buses uh, travel. So it's the number of miles of bus service per road, per road mile. Um, and that shows you the frequency, that's kind of a measure of overall frequency, how frequent your system is. So of all those cities, we're right in the middle, but you see there's like a big drop off right to PSTA. And then you got like Flint, Michigan way down here. No offense, Flint. Um, so we use this data for a whole bunch of things. We um, answer a lot of questions from board members and use it for the budget. This is a question that the board members have come up with a lot is, well, is PSDA overstaffed in certain areas? And we can say, well, actually, no, if you look, they're all about the same. We're right in the mix. Um, I, I won't, you can look at this in your report and ask me any questions. Um, do we have too many buses or run too many buses? Have we been increasing that over time? We're actually doing better. We're a very efficient system as far as the number of employees we carry. Um, as, as some of you might have known, we talk a lot about the kinds of buses we buy, electric, hybrids, diesels. Are we out of whack with everybody else? No. Um, this is where we are. We have majority of diesel buses, but we have hybrids, this light blue. But see, lots of people have about the same number of hybrid buses that we have. We also use this heavily for the budget. It's very important when we want to see, when we are looking at a new initiative, well, how does that track with areas that we need to invest in? Where do we need to invest? One area that we've always been way below average is in training, training of our employees. But you can see this is a graphic of every year for like the last seven years. We've recently put a lot of money into the budget to train our employees. And hopefully that's resulting in a lot of positive effects. But we're still way below budget, uh, way below the average. Um, this is a question that Track asks about. What about we just don't have very many shelters? And I knew that when I rode the bus that we need more shelters. <laughs> this graph, these dark blue lines, I kind of ignore because those are benches. We have a lot of benches um, everywhere, but that does not help lots of people in Florida, I now know. Um, so ignore that, the word number four. Look at our shelter, it's kind of low. Uh -huh. um, and so we are investing more in shelters. On-time performance is a big thing and that uh, we want to improve our, we're specifically tracking that ourselves. We're right in the middle um, at about 80% on time. This red and blue thing is PSTA, like almost everybody except for these two uh, systems, uses the real-time um, automatic tracking. So it's tracking every single bus, every single day, every single part of the route if it's on time. And it generates a report about whether the buses are running on time everywhere. Before we got that system, and before everybody got the system, they did it manually. They sent a, an employee out to uh, one spot, and he sat there all day, and he tracked when the buses arrived. And they usually pick like uh, Grand Central or Park Street and they just have a log where they just log in when all the buses come to that one spot. Um, that's what these two guys are doing at the top. That always generates a higher number because it's only tracking the one spot and all schedules are kind of left so that the driver can speed up at the very end and uh, make it to downtown Clearwater on time. But that doesn't mean he, he or she was on time the rest of the, the, rest of the way. One thing we've been tracking, working very hard is on our accidents uh, and uh, trying to obviously reduce accidents. That's one of the reasons we wanted to invest more in training. This sort of uh, is a kind of interesting graph that I like to see about uh, where we stand with overall accidents. We're, we're doing better on that. Um, uh, no, that's not it. Um, but we still are a little bit above average and then these different colors are the the types of accidents, preventable or unpreventable. Um, 
uh, and how they're, they're graded. And here, sort of over time, we've been trending up, and now we're above average on accidents. So Theo back there, he's going to bring this down, isn't he? Maybe. One thing that we've been way over uh, average on is passenger injuries, people who get injured on the bus. And we have been trying to train and invest in training the operators on ways that they might be able to mitigate that. And you can see it's been declining. We have been making some progress because we've been paying attention to it using this data. Still not where we need to be. Uh, last but not least is sort of the financial picture of where we stand. There's a lot of questions about our fare. This, this worries me um, about our fare, that maybe our fares are too high. Um, we see we're one of the highest fares in the country at 225. Now I know a lot of people don't pay at 225, but just in marketing of our services, when we post 225, that's a little bit higher than everybody else. When you look at then the average revenue per customer, which you know lots of people don't pay 225, they buy passes, they're transportation disadvantaged, they are on track so they get a free ride uh, or whatever. The average revenue per customer of PSPA is right here, right a little bit more than a dollar. And in 2015, that's where it was, but we're, it's going up. We're getting more revenue per customer. Um, just in one year, we moved up four slots. We're doing better on that. It still kind of worries me a little bit, though. Um, this also worries me. I know it worries the board. We, we're one of the lowest in investing in capital expenditures. You know, PSDA, like, like many of the cities, um, pretty much only uses the federal uh, money that we receive to invest in our capital program. Capital means the buses and the shelters, capital equipment. And the average of how much we invest per rider is one of the lowest. Also something that we're proud of, but again, it maybe reflects how much we can um, put in, but we are the lowest, the most cost-effective system out there. <coughs> it's hard to find another system that can operate either by mile, as this says, at $6 a mile, or at a little bit less than $100 an hour. None of the other uh, benchmarking groups. And if you look and you compare it to the one on the left, we're basically providing for the same amount of money twice as much service as, I don't know where that was, um, you notice all these graphs, I only show the where we are. I, I put blank everybody else because that's part of the program. It, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if this is Dayton, Ohio, or Flint, Michigan, or whatever. We only just really want to track ourselves. Um, that way, if a news reporter comes in and a news reporter from Dayton, Ohio is watching this presentation, they don't say, hey, Dayton, why are you so horrible compared to PSEA? Or, He's just trying to be nice, and I don't want—I don't want somebody from Eugene calling me either. Um, PSDA has has been very good about its budgets over the last several years, about staying, keeping our costs in line. Um, this is the total cost when um, reflecting inflation. Um, we've actually gone down in in total cost per hour. You look at where, where our costs are, that's right in line. Um, there's been some questions lately from the board, some board members, about whether our admin is too rich or our, our non-operational costs, our, o our overhead is too much. But that has also been held in line when, uh, when holding for inflation. We're actually down a little bit on that. Um, the one high year was 2014 when we did have more expenses related to outreach related to Greenlight, but then we have brought that cost back down. And in fact, this is they, they have so many different ways to look at costs that they do this little nice summary. And green is good and red is bad and white is kind of in the middle and we're the only one that has all green. Um, 
It's not like one area that we're really low cost. It's all parts of our organization. And I, I always try to kind of finish with this discussion. Um, this is what the board obviously has to deal with. How, how we fund the system. And what our board deals with is that we uh, is the local funding, because we're the local. We also receive federal and state money. Federal is red, state is light blue, and uh, dark blue is local. And you can see almost all of our funding for operations is local. That's why uh, we the PSA board concentrates on that. That's the property tax um, that we pay. The red is the federal funds that we use for operation, and that's about the same, well, lots of them are about the same as we are. And, but you can see the state varies pretty significantly. We uh, get about 10% of our funding from the state, but some, some systems, like, uh, I, think I don't know who this is, they don't have any local funding. They get all federal and state. So their board loves them. Uh, they don't have to worry about it. They just, um, you know, when it's just different, different factors that lead to that. So how do we use this? As you know, we've been doing benchmarking. We're using a whole performance scorecard system now. We now track the areas that we are below average, and we try to concentrate on those areas. So in our performance scorecard system, as you can see from this kind of summary chart that's providing, we're doing great on some things, and we're not doing so great on other things. And our goal this year is to improve on half at least half of these things that we're below average on. Now, we're not comparing to everybody else. We're just using this data and saying, let's improve our own performance. As long as the red bar goes up a teeny little bit, just for us, we met the goal. And so far, we're, we're doing OK on that. Um, that is how I think we can drive this, uh, use this data even better. And I'm very proud that we uh, do this. Um, I, I love looking at all this stuff, figuring out what we can do. Um, but I, I do feel like we're doing a pretty good job of getting more and more parts of our organization to pay attention to this and try to just you know improve what they're doing. Um, so that was a lot of fun data yeah, stuff. Yeah, that was I'm really sure great. you loved it. I liked it too. Those of us who are like data geeks are probably going to spend some time looking at this. Yeah, you can. I love that stuff too. That was great. Thank you. All right. Um, did, first of all, did anyone have any questions for Brad? And so the very last thing is member comments, and I'd like to just go around the room and if anyone has anything else they want to comment to the group. Well, thank you very much. We are going to meet again on the 17th of next month. So um, I look forward to seeing you all there. And we will turn the meeting then. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine.